the Blackstairs Mountains in County Carlow in the winter sunshine. From here, some of the countryside beyond the green fields seem bare and forbidding. Go closer to the ground and we can see evidence of our many ancestors' ghostly presence in ruined houses, overgrown walls or a gate lying in a ditch. These ruins are where people once lived, families who farmed, fished, laughed and sang. But the memories are kept either by the last few local survivors or lost in time. Into this area comes the modern form of professional ghost hunter, the vernacular archaeologist. They try and record the buildings, track down the stories of lives lived, how they worked and built, so that by understanding our past, we better equip ourselves as we journey into an uncertain future. The vernacular itself really relates to people and particularly, if you like, in inverted commas, ordinary people. Um, and I, I, would, uh, <laughs> I would emphasize the inverted commas because ordinary people are often extraordinary. So it's just the sub, sort of unconscious way of just getting on with life is vernacular. Something which is representative of long living, uh, generations, centuries, thousands, millions of years perhaps, of humans. Uh, just getting on with life. There are stories down every little lane in Ireland. People who lived their lives, children who ran up and down the lanes, animals that were tended to. And we want to record all of this for posterity because it's being lost to modern Ireland. Well, sure, I could remember back, I suppose, to, I was born in 41, I remember back to the end of the 40s. Today, there's only a couple farm and the whole lot whereas that time they were probably eight or ten in the town's land. You know, a young fella anyway, I remember a good few old fellas around. and it was O'Brien's and Holden's. This was floods for Foley's, Lennon's and Lennon's and Culleton's, Dorn's, Cody's, Ryan's. I live in Walsh's town in the parish of Bars, in the barony of St Mullins. The Irish for it is Bolyany Bratnach. The reason it got this name is because a lot of people named Walsh's lived in it. There are eight houses in it and 27 people. This is Hayden name, and I knew the two people that lived here all their life, yeah. They were married. And when the two of them died in, he died in 1980, so. There's dials here now, this is a little house is here. There was a shop there one time. A little shop, yeah. Yeah, exactly there, yeah. The fact that we're in the shadow of the mountain here, um, it was about a sustainable life and surviving. They took nothing for granted. Um, and that's, that's quite attractive as a heritage professional, you know, and, and as somebody who's collecting stories. She used to get up at six o'clock to go up and cut the bushes on the hill to come down to light the fire, to draw on the bake pan to make the bread and draw the water from in a buckets from the well out the back of the house or go to the river with a horse, you know. That sort of thing, like, it must have been terrible. But sure, I suppose it was the way of life and they just got on. But there was no other option, was there? They had no electricity, they never heard tell of electricity or no running water. Or, no toilets. I mean, it was everyone took it for granted, and that was it, you know. If you think of an ordnance survey map, it's a really bare, undernourished document. But once you start talking to people, and you find that, well, this is called the New Line, or that's called uh, the, the Bull Lane, suddenly you're seeing uh, history and people coming into the landscape. Which around here, every field was that there was Hayden now. 
And this, there was a ditch there that was mine. Next one above was mine. Big piece, big piece, and that was the back of my cable they called that field there. We have one that's called Bonta. And there's one beside the called Colleen. And the Carawas. And the bog, there'd be nothing different about that. The baiting. Our one's down there is Jim Nail's bog. Jim Nail's bog field. And then there's Elsie's big bog, and then there's Bulger's fire bog. But as far as he could look at a twirling Bulger's bog at all, we don't know who owned the bush. We called it Bulger's bog. Maybe Uncle Tom, I don't know how it worked out. But that's the way they were, yeah. When I was going to school, I think there was, for most of the time, there was only myself going out this town's land. Then the AFU of the Dalton started, that's another name. They had no desks. They used to leave the paper or slate on their knees and sit down on the floor and write. Each pupil had to bring a sod of turf to make a fire, and they also had to bring a penny each to their teacher each week for what they were learning. Every lane in Ireland, there was a community who lived there, people who lived their whole lives. And we're very interested in the stories of that laneway, um, the names of the fields, what family lived in this house or that house. Who told me when they came down here, or oh, Maggie told me about, they came down to the wake, the house was so small, they came down to the wake and they had them standing up against the wall, so I tied up against the wall, standing up and he did. Yeah, honest to God, yeah. Maggie will tell herself, oh no, Maggie's dead, God forgive me. Tell me that herself. It's only when you get older you realise that like, you didn't know more. Like, my father was here for a long time, like he was 102. When he died and he knew a good bit. And it was the class I got out of his memory, I suppose, by the time we got interested in it. One of my jobs in the department has been to draw up a strategy for vernacular. Uh, what we've inherited, but what we can bring into the future. Uh, it's, you know, it's, a key, it's a key aspect now of government policy on heritage to move the vernacular into the future safely. <laughs>